Now, at this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Mark Redding, who will be our speaker today. Dr. Redding is director of the Center for Bleeding and Clotting Disorders and professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology, Oncology, and Transplantation at the University of Minnesota. Additionally, Dr. Redding has laboratory research, research experience investigating the mechanisms of the immune response to factor VIII and has served as principal investigator of many clinical trials in hemophilia. Welcome, Dr. Redding. Thank you very much, Brendan. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining. Uh, it's the end of a very long day for uh, most of you, I think, um, certainly for myself. So uh, I've been looking forward to this all day. It's really um, an exciting time in the treatment of hemophilia. And we've got a lot of things to talk about. So the, the, the topic is advancements in the treatment of hemophilia. And uh, before we get started here, just some disclosures. All right, let's launch right into this. So this is a, a, a figure that you've probably seen before in some uh, shape or another. This is sort of a timeline of all of the different things that have evolved over the course of the last 120 years or so uh, in terms of hemophilia treatment. And, and these are just some of the milestones along the way. Um, the, the, again, the topic tonight is advancements in treatment. And, and what I wanna really focus on is, is what, what advances we've made over the last century or so, uh, and then really focus on where are we going from here. So, you know, when we think about advancements and things, we think about what's going on right now, but I, I wanted to just uh, spend a minute or two before we get into that and put some of this into some historical uh, context, because there really have been a lot of important advancements along the way. So if we think about what hemophilia treatment was like in the 1960s, um, it's pretty different than it was today. Um, most of the treatment happened in the hospital. Essentially, all of it happened in the hospital. Unfortunately, the average life expectancy for someone with hemophilia in the 1960s was, was pretty low, about 20. Uh, and most of our uh, individuals with hemophilia, um, at least severe hemophilia, were severely disabled. So really a very um, different outlook than we see today. In 2020, uh, hemophilia is treated in the home. Uh, life expectancy is normal. And really, joint disease is virtually non-existent in younger patients uh, unless they have an inhibitor because they have access to regular prophylaxis. And so just these two pictures, I think, really illustrate the striking difference between the way treatment used to be and the way treatment is. You notice this uh, picture on the bottom. This is happening outside. Um, this is happening up at hemophilia camp. And so really a very striking difference. So, so from that perspective, the advances are, are, are pretty amazing. Now, if we kind of take a step back and look at what's happened along the way, you know, for the first several decades or actually probably 80 years of, of the 1900s, um, there were advances, but, but they weren't really the sort of advances that allowed us to have treatment that was all that successful. We did learn uh, years ago how to fractionate blood, how to separate blood uh, into its different components. Um, and that led to the ability then to be able to increase the concentration of factor in the blood products we were using. And eventually this led to the ability to give a product that had enough factor in it you know, to actually treat bleeds or to provide coverage for surgery. And this was a pretty major advance uh, back in the day. Um, slowly over time, the commercially available concentrates became available. And at that point, we were able to transition from hospital-based to home-based therapy for hemophilia. So, you know, compared to today's standards, maybe that doesn't seem like a huge advance, but back in the day, this was certainly a significant uh, advance in our treatment ability. Fast forward, um, you know, I think most of us would argue that the modern era of treatment for hemophilia started in the 1990s with the development of the recombinant factor product. Um, but really, for a long time, not a lot changed. We had, we saw a lot of recombinant products coming onto the market. Uh, in the 1990s and early 2000s, and um, these were all very welcomed, but you know they didn't really look that different than the previous products. They were all dosed very similarly, um, and we all expected them. We expected them all to work very similarly. What happened in 2014, though, was the beginning of the current area era of advances in treatment, and that was with the development of the extended half-life factors. For the first time in about 30 years, we had factor products that looked different than the factor products that came before. The dosing regimens were different. The drugs were different. We had to start paying attention to lab assays because the lab tests that we used weren't the same uh, for all of these. And so things really started to change. 
Of course, the main advance with the extended half-life factors were that the frequency of the infusions went down. This led, leads to better adherence, the ability to have higher trough levels, that leads to better bleed protection, and really the, the use of pharmacokinetic guided dose tailoring um, uh, that, that was really ushered in with the EHL products when they hit the scene uh, six years ago, seven years ago, I guess now. And then of course, soon after that, non-factor therapy uh, became uh, something that we had uh, as, a, as a tool in our toolbox as well. Um, for the first time, we had subcutaneous dosing. This was a huge advantage. In addition, we had a treatment that worked regardless of whether or not an inhibitor was present. That was certainly a major advantage. We'll talk about uh, these two categories in a little bit more detail but this just gives you a, a time frame for advancements that have been made over many decades in the treatment of hemophilia. So let's take a moment and just look a little bit more closely at the extended half-life factor products. This essentially involves attaching something to the factor eight or factor nine protein that makes it stick around longer. There are three main ways this is done, uh, FC fusion, pegylation, and albumin fusion. Now these are techniques that have been used for many years in the pharmaceutical industry to extend the life or the half-life of various medications. So that technology is not really new, it's just newly applied to hemophilia. The goal of this is to allow the factor to stick around longer. And as I mentioned earlier, this leads to less frequent infusions and the ability to have higher trough levels. In terms of the advance, what did this really translate into kind of on a practical level? The half-life prolongation for factor eight was moderate, um, not as much as we'd hoped for. And we'll talk about why that is in just a little bit. Um, but really, we went from dosing every two to three days to dosing every three to seven days uh, for some individuals. And so this was certainly a step forward. Now, for the extended half-life factor nine products, the half-life prolongation is a lot more dramatic. Dosing once or twice a week converted to dosing once every one to two weeks. And so that was certainly more what we were all looking for. So this is definitely an advance forward, but really just the beginning of a series of advancements that we're going to be talking about tonight. Let's take a minute and talk about emicizumab or non-factor therapy. So uh, this was certainly a significant advancement in the treatment of hemophilia. The cartoon at the top just shows how this medication works and not to belabor the point, but suffice it to say that this is a medication that's an antibody um, and it really serves the same pur purpose as factor eight in the coagulation cascade. Over on the left-hand side of the cartoon, you see that factor eight sits there on the phospholipid surface. That's the platelets that provide that, by the way. And the job of factor eight is to bring factor 9A and factor 10 next to each other so that factor 10 becomes activated and the coagulation cascade continues. The way this particular medication works is to basically replicate that. So this is an antibody. One arm of the antibody recognizes factor 9A. The other arm recognizes factor 10. And it turns out that this antibody is about the same size as a factor eight molecule. And so it essentially does the same thing. It brings factor 9A and factor 10 together so that factor 10 can be activated and the coagulation system can do its thing. This was the first highly effective therapy for prophylaxis in those with hemophilia A who had inhibitors. And, and I, can't, I can't overstate how big of a deal that is. Um, this was approved for inhibitor patients in November of 2017. And for the first time ever, we actually had effective prophylaxis for our inhibitor patients. It was approved the following year for those without inhibitors, and the rest is sort of history, as, as they say. Um, again, this is subcutaneous dosing, and as you probably all know, the regimens that are used are once a week, every two weeks, or even monthly, depending on how much you use. And so, so this was really a huge advance forward. Now, I wanna just take a minute and, and illustrate an important point about the difference between factor replacement therapy and non-factor therapy, in this case, emicizumab because we're gonna come back to this concept a little bit later on tonight when we talk about some of the new drugs in development. So the graphs at the bottom represent the degree to which the ability to clot becomes normal. So if you look over on the left-hand side, we've got, a, we've got what it looks like with factor replacement. Um, across the top is that shaded area. This is, this is the zone of normal clotting ability. Down at the bottom of the graph, we have that red dashed line. That means that's the bleeding threshold. So ideally, you want to stay above that bleeding threshold, and, and, and that would then prevent bleeds from happening. So with factor replacement therapy, we're replacing what the body is missing. Uh, with non-factor therapy, we're using a medication that mimics the role of the factor that's missing. So it's not quite the same. It's substitution therapy, not replacement therapy. With factor replacement, as you can see from the graph, we do transiently get into the normal clotting ability range. and That's really important. After a dose of factor, the level goes up into that normal range. Unfortunately, it doesn't stay there as long as we want it to maybe, but you do at least at some point 
for some length of time have normal clotting ability after a dose of factor. With the non-factor replacement therapies, you can see from the graph, we get above that bleeding threshold, but we don't ever get into the normal clotting ability range, and that's an important distinction. With factor replacement therapy, we can easily measure the factor level and know where we are. We're not quite there yet with non-factor therapy, but we're working on that. The last distinction I want to point out here is that with factor replacement therapy, we can use this treatment to both treat bleeds and also to prevent bleeds. With non-factor therapy as we currently have it, this is really just a preventative or a prophylactic treatment. This is not something we can use to treat bleeds, again, because we don't get into that normal clotting ability range. So these are really important differences. Um, and I think it's important just to take a minute to, to take this in because we're gonna come back to this concept a couple times later on in the program. All right, let's move ahead. So what we're gonna spend the bulk of our time talking about are these seven drugs. These are seven drugs that are currently in very active clinical development. Um, and I, I, there are a number of other drugs I'm not gonna have time to mention tonight, but I tried to pick one from each of the different categories just to give you an example for where we are and the kind of things that are going on. And these are also drugs that are fairly far along in their research uh, development pipeline and are likely to be available in the relatively near future. So uh, forgive me if I overlooked your favorite drug in development, um, but these are the ones I think that are, that are really uh, on the horizon here. After we go through these, then uh, we're gonna spend some time talking about gene therapy and how that all fits in before we wrap things up tonight. So as you can see from this table, um, over on the left-hand side are the names of the drugs and we'll, we'll talk through those in some more detail. You can see in the next column, the different categories. We've got a factor eight drug, a factor nine drug, uh, a mimetic, uh, a bypassing agent, and then some other drugs in different categories that are also non-factor therapy. Um, I've just listed the companies that are developing these drugs for your reference. And then over on the right-hand side, uh, I'm gonna just highlight uh, at a very high level, and we'll talk about this in more detail later, but what, what advancements do these drugs offer? Because again, that's the topic for tonight is the advancements of treatment. So starting with the first one, uh, the advancement here, this is a next generation extended half-life factor eight product. And as I'll show you in just a few minutes, this, this allows for much higher trough levels with, with infrequent dosing uh, than we can currently get with our product. So this is really something that's gonna be better than the current EHL product, uh, assuming it makes it. The next one, the factor nine drug, um, this, the big advantage here is this, this can be dosed subcutaneously. Uh, the trough levels achieved are similar to what we currently get with our extended half-life factor nine products, but those are all given intravenously. And so the potential for sub-Q dosing with this drug is what appeals. The next one is another version of uh, emicizumab, so to speak. It's, it's more potent though, and so that's its advantage. And we'll talk about that in detail. Moving on down for the last four, again, all of these drugs are subcutaneously dosed. And so that's a major advance. In addition, these drugs also potentially might work for other bleeding disorders outside of hemophilia. And also the last three on the list there um, would potentially be prophylaxis for hemophilia B patients with inhibitors. And that's a huge unmet need right now. So we'll talk about all these advancements in a little bit more detail as we go through each of these, but I wanted to just give you an overview and kind of highlight some of the key points. Before we talk about the first drug in some more detail, I wanted to just take a minute to explain why is this all happening? You know, if you think about those first few slides we looked at and you think about all the advances and you think of where we are now compared to where we were just, you know, a decade or two ago, um, you know, you, you certainly would say that, yes, we've made a lot of progress, but we're not done yet. We haven't gotten where we really want to be in terms of hemophilia therapy. So what's driving all this new drug development uh, is really that concept. All of the currently approved treatments require repeated injections given over a lifetime. Yes, some of them are now subcutaneous, but that's still a lot of pokes. More importantly, I think the real key here is that our goal of zero bleeds has not yet been achieved. None of the current, currently approved therapies really can achieve zero bleeds forever. And that's really what we're looking for. The sustained normal clotting ability that we want is also not provided by the current options. And then lastly, although gene therapy is happening, uh, we'll talk about that towards the end, um, it's definitely coming, um, but we still have a fair bit of work to do before that's gonna be a reality for all. And so all of these things are still unmet needs and all of these are the reasons why all this new drug development is going on at such a rapid pace. Okay, so let's take a look at the first one of these seven drugs. And again, we're gonna move through these fairly quickly. I wanna just cover the highlights. I'm gonna try not to show a lot of data from studies. What I really wanna focus on is what's the difference between 
this drug and the drugs that are currently out there and how it might find a role as an advancement compared to what we currently have. So this first drug uh, is this extended half-life factor eight product that's probably a second generation or a new generation EHL factor eight. Uh, it's got a name that's difficult to pronounce, so I won't try. Um, we tend to call this drug BIV, B-I-V-V-001 is, uh, is the name it was given as it was being developed. Um, I think a lot of us are gonna keep calling it BIV just cause that's easy. Um, this is a B domain deleted recombinant factor A protein that has FC fusion. So this looks like one of the currently available EHL factor eight products. But in addition to the FC fusion, there are a couple of other things attached to this factor eight molecule that further extend its half-life. One of those is something called X10. These are biodegradable protein polymers that are used to extend the half-life of other drugs as well. So that's just being borrowed and then applied to factor eight. And then lastly, the most important part, I think, and the really unique part of this one uh, is the von Willebrand factor uh, portion. So von Willebrand factor is another clotting protein. Uh, and there's a certain portion of that von Willebrand factor protein that is attached to this particular drug. Uh, it's called the D'D3 prime domain. And what this does is it allows this drug to circulate unbound to the plasma factor of von Willebrand factor. And why is that important? It's important because the problem with the current EHL factor eight drugs is their half-life is, is dependent in part on the half-life of von Willebrand factor. Um, and so that's sort of a biological ceiling that we weren't able to overcome. And so when we attached PEG or FC or albumin or whatever it is to extend the half-life, if a drug also has to be bound to von Willebrand factor, that's gonna be a limitation that we can't overcome unless we find something else to substitute for that. And so that's essentially what they've done here. So bottom line is there's just a couple extra things attached to this one to make it stick around even longer than the current EHL products. Taking a quick look at just some, some high level data from uh, a study that was published uh, pretty recently. Um, this is a small study. Uh, where they took 16 individuals uh, with severe hemophilia A, these are adults. Um, they got a single IV infusion of factor eight. They waited for a while for that to wash out and then they repeated with single infusion of BIV001. Uh, as you can see from these graphs over on the side, there are two different doses, a lower dose and a higher dose. And really what I wanna emphasize here is the difference. So if you look at these graphs, the lighter colored bar shows how long factor eight, recombinant factor eight, standard factor eight sticks around. The darker colored bar shows how long BIV001 sticks around. You can see there's a pretty big difference uh, between these. The graph shows what the factor eight level is over time. So just looking at the graphs without looking at the numbers and, and getting all into all the details, you can see there's a pretty big difference between these. And really the key here is that in, in the higher dose group shown at the bottom there, um, the factor eight level was normal, which is about 51% for four days after the infusion and was at 17% seven days later. So these are levels that are much, much higher than we would expect to see with any of the currently available factor eight products. And that's really what this one potentially can offer us. In terms of where it is right now, there's a phase three study going on called Extend One. This study started December, 2019. It's estimated to complete very soon in January of this coming year. Um, the goal was to enroll 150 subjects. These are 12 years of age and older with severe hemophilia A. The dosing that they're using in the study is 50 units per kilo IV given once weekly. They picked that dose because this is the dose that they thought was gonna keep the factor levels above 10% for that whole week. And so again, this would be a much higher trough level than we're used to seeing. So we eagerly await the results of this study and assuming that they're positive, I think soon after that, uh, we'll probably see this drug up for approval. There's also a pediatric study that just started this year in February. Um, and that's slated for completion in a couple of years. And so uh, we'll see how this works out in children as well. So this is pretty exciting. Uh, and definitely if this one makes it would be an advance in our treatment options for hemophilia A. Okay, let's turn to the next one. This is a drug that's a factor nine drug. This is Delsi Nonacog Alpha or Delsa A is the sort of the code name for it. Uh, this is a full length factor nine protein, which is much more potent than standard factor nine, 22 fold greater potency than the factor nine that we have now. How they've achieved this is they've made some, uh, some slight modifications to the protein. They've, they've substituted three amino acids, which translate into increasing some of the biologic things the protein has to do. Its affinity for factor 8A is increased. The speed with which factor 10 is activated is increased. And then resistance to, to being broken down by antithrombin 
uh, is conferred by one of these amino acid substitutions. So some really targeted adjustments to the protein to give it more favorable biologic activity. The main difference between this one and the current factor nine products is that it can be given subcutaneously and the volume is quite small actually, it's less than one milliliter. Let's take a, a high level look at some study data. This is a phase two study, again in adults. It's a small study, only six patients. They were given a single IV dose of the drug as a loading dose and then daily subcutaneous injections over the course of a month. Uh, now, one subject did drop out after a week because of injection site reactions, and there were a few of those in the other subjects as well, although they were milder. Uh, I'll come back to that point in just a second. Uh, let's take a look at the data here. So these are the results uh, of, of the factor nine levels in those subjects over the course of the 28 days. As you can see, all of the subjects uh, had steady state factor nine levels achieved that were around 12% or even a bit higher. Uh, there were no bleeding events that occurred during that period of time, so that's encouraging. Uh, and the thought here was that this prolonged half-life and the stability of the levels at that higher range could allow for potentially less frequent dosing. They dosed it every day uh, in this particular study, but perhaps they could get by with less frequent dosing. So they're looking into that. And again, the major advantage of this one is that it can be given subcutaneously, and that's a, a big advantage over all of the currently available factor nine products, uh, which are IV. In terms of where this one is uh, in, in its uh, development, uh, there was data presented just uh, a month ago at the ISTH meeting. They're working really hard now on trying to, to lessen the issue of those injection site reactions. So there was some data presented recently about some strategies they're using to figure that out. Uh, there was another paper published uh, just within the last few weeks. Um, this particular factor nine is being looked at as a potential uh, factor nine uh, uh, protein for gene therapy. They'll, they'll take this factor nine and insert it into a gene therapy cassette. And, and this could potentially uh, uh, result in much better factor nine levels if that works out. That's in a very early uh, animal model kind of stage uh, of development yet, but some exciting things going on potentially there as well. So we're, we're eagerly anticipating further data coming out on this factor nine drug. Okay, let's take a look at the third one. This one's called MIM-8. Uh, this is a next generation factor eight mimetic. This is very much like emicizumab in terms of how it works. It has the sa same mechanism of action. It's a bispecific antibody. One arm of the antibody recognizes factor 9A, the other arm recognizes factor 10. Uh, the difference with this one is it's more potent. It's about 15 times more potent than emicizumab, at least in laboratory, uh, in vitro and animal models. In terms of human data, we don't have much. A phase one, two study just opened in January of last year. Uh, the first part of that is to look in healthy subjects just to get some more data about safety and tolerability. Um, the second part of this study uh, will be looking at subjects with hemophilia A with or without inhibitors. Uh, they're gonna be looking at weekly or monthly subcutaneous doses. And we anticipate this study will be completed sometime in the early part of 2024. So we don't have a lot of human data yet uh, but we're eagerly awaiting this. The fact that it's more potent uh, potentially means that this uh, particular drug could get us closer to that normal clotting uh, zone, uh, and that might be an advantage uh, over the current product. It's also possible that because it's more potent, we wouldn't need to give quite as much of it, and perhaps that would make it less expensive. There are some potential advantages in, in some areas that we just need some more data to have better understanding of. Okay, let's take a look at the third one. This one is called Marzeptacog Alpha Activated or Mars AA, kind of a, kind of a cool uh, nickname. Um, this is a bypassing agent. So this is a modified recombinant factor 7A, similar to, to the factor nine drug I showed you a couple, of, uh, couple of slides ago. Um, this one has some amino acid substitutions as well. So they've gone in and they've changed just a couple of really key uh, parts of the protein to make it biologically work a little bit more effectively. This one is about ninefold more potent than the current recombinant factor 7A products on the market like uh, Eptacog Alpha or Eptacog Beta. Um, subcutaneous dosing is also possible with this one. And with subcutaneous dosing, this one has a half-life of around nine and a half hours. And that's a fair bit longer than what we see uh, with IV dosing. And so there are some potential advantages in that way as well. In terms of clinical trial data, here's some data from a phase two study. Uh, this is being looked at in hemophilia A or B with inhibitors, so similar to our current bypassing therapy. They looked at doing daily subcutaneous injections uh, with the option to escalate the dose if needed for breakthrough bleeds. They had nine subjects in this study, so again, a pretty small study. Um, they had a, a total of 500 plus injections over the course of three months. 
only two of the subjects had to escalate above the starting dose. So at that starting dose of 30 mics per kilo, this drug seemed to work pretty well for most people. Um, if you take a look at how the bleed rates were, they went down quite significantly. Uh, and seven of the nine subjects had zero bleeding events during that three month study period. So it's a pretty short study, uh, but with some pretty promising looking results. Overall, this drug was well tolerated, although like the other one that we looked at here, uh, there are some injection site reactions that occur, and so that may or may not turn out to be an issue that needs further investigation. In terms of where Mars AA currently is, uh, there are, there's a phase three study going on. Uh, it actually just opened uh, in May of this year. Uh, the goal is to get 60 subjects enrolled. They're gonna be looking at treatment of bleeds in adolescents and adults with hemophilia A or B with inhibitors compared to standard treatment. Now, the more exciting thing, I think, is this phase one, two study, which also just opened in May. Uh, this is gonna be a little bit smaller study, but the thing that's exciting here is they're gonna be looking beyond hemophilia. They're gonna take a look at factor seven deficiency, Landsman thrombosthenia, which is a platelet, uh, inherited platelet disorder, and also looking at hemophilia A patients with inhibitors who are on emicizumab. They're looking to see uh, if, if it will work to treat bleeds in that context as well. And so the potential advance here with this one uh, in terms of potency and subcutaneous dosing, also, this one might be a, appropriate for other bleeding disorders beyond hemophilia, and I think that would be an advance uh, as well. So we're eagerly awaiting uh, further results of these studies uh, also. Okay, we're going to take a look now at the last three, but before we do that, I want to just take a step back and, and talk about the concept of how these drugs all work. So uh, and that concept is rebalancing the clotting system. Now, you've probably seen this figure. It's been used a fair bit, some version of this figure, but it's worth just taking a minute uh, to walk through this one. So over on the left-hand side, under normal circumstances, the clotting system is in balance. There are proteins that help to make clot, and there are proteins that help to regulate the clotting system. Those are called anticoagulant proteins. If you look in the middle panel, the problem in hemophilia is that we're missing some of the clot making proteins. So low factor eight or low factor nine levels, and that tips the balance towards bleeding. Now, normally to fix that, we give factor eight or we give factor nine back, and we bring things back into balance that way. The idea here with these drugs, these non-factor replacement therapies, these rebalancing therapies, the idea is rather than adding back what's missing, what about if we took away some of the other stuff? What about if we reduce the amount or we reduce the function of some of those anticoagulant proteins? Might we bring things back into balance that way? And that's really the concept behind the next three drugs that we're gonna cover. Now, this is a very oversimplified um, version of how, how this really works. Of course, the clotting system is, is very, very complicated. Anytime we start messing around, uh, with these regulatory proteins, there are potential downsides to that, and we'll, and we'll touch on some of that as we review some of the clinical trial data for these drugs. But suffice it to say, this is a very neat concept, and, and at least in, in, in principle, uh, this, this could be potentially a significant advance forward, not only for hemophilia, but this might also work uh, for other bleeding disorders as well. There's a lot of enthusiasm behind the development of the next three drugs we're going to talk about. Uh, the examples here, uh, concizumab, uh, marstazumab, and fetuzaran are the drugs. Uh, these are being studied predominantly in hemophilia A or B with or without inhibitors. So again, it hits that niche of hemophilia B and hemophilia B with inhibitors in particular. So this is a, a huge unmet need in our community right now, is better treatments for our hemophilia B inhibitor patients. And again, as I mentioned, possibly other bleeding disorders besides hemophilia as well. Again, like the other non-factor replacement therapies we talked about, MIM-8 and emicizumab, uh, these drugs will be used for prophylaxis, not for treatment of bleed, at least as, as we currently understand how to use them. Let's just take a look at each of these uh, a little bit more detail here. So the first one is concizumab. Uh, this is a monoclonal antibody that binds to something called TFPI, which is tissue factor pathway inhibitor. This is one of those regulatory anticoagulant proteins. So the idea here is that we we inhibit the action or the function of one of those regulatory proteins to bring things back into balance that way. The clinical trial program for concizumab is called Explorer, and there are a number of studies that have been done and that are ongoing, and they're, they're, they're numbered, so Explorer 1, Explorer 2, et cetera. The phase three studies that are ongoing right now are Explorer 7 and Explorer 8. These started in the fall of 2019. Um, Explorer 7 looks at hemophilia A or B with inhibitors. Explorer 8 is looking at hemophilia A or B patients without inhibitors. They're studying both. Uh, very ambitious goal. They're looking for 300 subjects. Again, this is adult and adolescent. 
This is once daily prophylaxis, subcutaneous objection with a pen device, kind of like an insulin pen. Uh, the company that's making this drug also makes insulin, and so they've got that technology, and that's one of the potential uh, advantages for them. So once daily prophylaxis, sub-Q injection. Now, a word about the potentials that I mentioned earlier. So the trials were paused in March of last year due to some clotting events. Fortunately, they weren't fatal, but there were three subjects that had clotting episodes, and so they had to kind of take a step back and take a look at how to adjust things to get around that. And Fortunately, they were able to come up with a strategy, and so these trials resumed in December of 2020, and we anticipate they'll be done hopefully by the end of 2024. So we have to wait a little bit to get some more data on this one, but I think this clinical trial program is moving along uh, with good progress. This next drug, uh, marstosumab, is another anti-TFPI antibody, so it, it works through that same pathway that we just talked about with concizumab uh, by inhibiting tissue factor pathway inhibitor, TFPI. Um, now, this one isn't quite as far along. Uh, there were some data presented just last month at the ISTH meeting from a phase two study, pretty small study, only 20 subjects, um, most of whom had hemophilia A. In fact, there's only one hemophilia B patient in this uh, phase two study. Um, this is, again, subcutaneous injections, but this one's being given weekly uh, in this particular regimen, so a little less frequent injection. Uh, from this very early uh, clinical trial data, we saw a pretty significant reduction in bleeds over the course of a year, about a 90% reduction. Uh, so that's a pretty impressive uh, response. Uh, there's another phase three study underway. This one opened in March of 2020, and the first subject was dosed actually just in November, so not even a year ago. This one is still really early on. Uh, the goal of this uh, phase three study with this drug is to get 145 subjects, again, adolescent and adult, hemophilia A or B with or without inhibitors. And again, they're gonna look at weekly prophylaxis with those sub-Q injections. And this one's slated for completion around this time in 2023, so a couple of years from now. That brings us to Fetuzaran. So Fetuzaran um, is a drug that's also in this category of rebalancing therapies, but it works through a little bit different mechanism. Uh, this is an RNA, excuse me, an RNA interference therapeutic. And what this thing does is it decreases the production of something called antithrombin. Antithrombin is another one of those anticoagulant or clot regulating proteins, kind of like TFPI, but it works in a different part of the clotting system. So the idea here is to reduce the production of antithrombin and bring things back into balance that way. Now this one is also subcutaneous, but they're looking at monthly subcutaneous injections. So, so pretty infrequent administration, again, for prophylaxis. This is being studied in hemophilia A and hemophilia B with or without inhibitors, so similar to the other ones. The clinical trial program for Fetuzaran is called ATLAS, and there are a variety of studies with ATLAS in their name. Now, the clinical trials, uh, the early clinical trials were put on hold back in 2017, again, because of a clotting issue that was seen. There was a subject uh, in the phase two study uh, that unfortunately died after developing a clot in uh, around the brain. The cerebral venous sinuses are the veins that drain the brain. Unfortunately, this person suffered a clot uh, in that area that, that led to death. Um, part of the issue here is that initially they thought that this was a bleeding episode, and so the patient was being treated with doses of factor to treat a bleed, uh, and the doses that were used were, were in excess of the guidelines that were recommended. Uh, and by the time they got all this figured out and realized it was actually a clot, uh, unfortunately, this individual passed away. Um, but after they looked through that and understood more what happened, uh, the trial was able to resume later on in 2017. Now, in terms of where we are now, phase three studies, there are several of them ongoing uh, with Fetuzaran. They started in 2018, and they're due to wrap up later this year or early this coming year. So we're getting really close to having some phase three data um, hopefully published uh, in the next uh, few months. Uh, there's an extension study ongoing uh, that's expected to complete uh, in about five years. So a long-term follow-up study, there'll be some good data to look at. Also a pediatric study going on that started last year also slated to complete in about five years, assuming things go as planned. Now, similar to what I just mentioned and similar to some of the other ones that we've talked about, uh, these clinical trials were also temporarily put on hold in October of this last year, uh, again, in response to some clotting events. Fortunately, these weren't fatal, but there were four additional clots that were seen. And so they had to go back and take a look and try to understand why is this happening? And what where they were able to determine is that the risk of clotting seemed to be an issue primarily when those antithrombin levels were getting very, very low, less than 10% of the normal range. So they've made some adjustments to the protocol and the dosing, and the goal now is to try to target antithrombin levels 
uh, to get no lower than 15% and, and only up to about 35%. We have to get them down to a certain point for the drug to work. We don't want it to get down too low. And so they were able to figure that out to make some adjustments. And so the trials are up and running again as of December. So, you know, this, these are unfortunate things that happen in these trials, but this is why we do trials, right? We have to figure out uh, how, how these drugs can be used and how they can be used safely. So this is all part of the, part of the process. All right, so that gets us through seven drugs that are in development, uh, all moving along very, very nicely, very quickly. Uh, data starting to come out and a lot more data anticipated in the near future. So we're very hopeful that, that some of these drugs, maybe all of them, uh, will eventually get approved and we'll have a lot more tools in our toolbox. Okay, so now I wanna shift gears and talk about gene therapy. So we've covered a lot of stuff and I know I'm moving through this pretty quickly, but I wanna make sure we get uh, get to the end of this, we've got some time for questions as well. I'm keeping an eye on the time here. Um, so what about gene therapy? You know, we, we could talk for an hour on gene therapy. And I know Dr. Singleton gave a talk yesterday on gene therapy. And um, I'm going to sort of cover some of the same material that she did. And, and really what I'm going to try to do is just introduce the topic and, and, and put some stuff out there for you to think about. I'm not going to go through data. I'm not going to show you results from studies. Um, because I think we're not we're not at the point where we need to do that. We need to really think about how is this going to fit into the overall picture? What kind of advance does gene therapy really offer for us? Uh, and so I want to spend my, the time that we have tonight talking uh, from those perspectives. So, you know, this is just a, a cartoon or a schematic, I guess, that, that kind of illustrates what the goal is here. So the idea is that with gene therapy, we fix a broken gene. The problem with hemophilia and other bleeding disorders, that there's a mutation in a gene, the gene is broken, if we fix that gene, we should then cure the disease. So it makes, makes perfect sense at a, at a simple level. The question really is how do we fix the gene? And, and that's what gene therapy does. Now, I wanted to just take a minute to talk about um, some different uh, technologies that are all sort of in the gene therapy category uh, and, and focus on the one that we're using for hemophilia. So you've may have, you may have heard of CRISPR. Um, this is a technology that's really gene editing. This is where we go in and actually repair or replace a broken gene directly. We're not doing that for hemophilia, but that sometimes gets confused with these others. So I wanted to call that out separately. Similarly, in the middle panel there, there's a thing called uh, CAR T cell therapy that you may have heard of that. That's being used for a lot of malignant blood diseases right now. Uh, and this is a, a concept where they take cells out of the body, they modify those cells, and they put them back into the body, and then they, they perform a function. So this is a form of gene therapy, but it's not what we're doing with hemophilia. With hemophilia, we're really looking at gene transfer. So over on the left-hand side of the screen, that panel shows the way we're approaching gene therapy for hemophilia. So we're doing what we call vector-based gene therapy. The idea is that we inject the gene into the body. So it's not in the cell already. That's not happening like it is in CAR, CAR T therapy. We're actually injecting the vector into the body. A vector is a vehicle, a transport vehicle to deliver the gene that we're trying to get uh, into, the, into the cells. These vectors travel then to various parts of the body. In this case, it's to the liver. And then the, 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 the DNA is delivered to the liver cells. The liver cells then make the factor. And that's how gene therapy is done for hemophilia. So we're introducing functional copies of the gene into the body with vector-based gene therapy. And again, that's the strategy for hemophilia. So why is hemophilia a target for gene therapy? Um, you know, I think it's, it's worth taking a minute to think about that. Well, the first thing is that hemophilia A and B are what we call monogenetic diseases. So one gene mutation causes the problem, or one gene needs to be fixed. So that, that lends itself to gene therapy uh, pretty nicely. If there were multiple genes involved, it'd be a lot harder to do. A second feature of hemophilia is that the clinical manifestations, the bleeding and all the consequences thereof, are due to a single missing protein. And so if we can just get that one protein uh, level into a better place, we can have a significant impact on the clinical course of the disease. In addition, we're lucky in hemophilia in that we have very well characterized animal models, both mouse models and larger animal models uh, that we've been able to use to study these new treatments, including gene therapy. Those are really important tools uh, before we bring this into humans, of course, to make sure that we're doing things safely. Another feature of hemophilia that lends itself to gene therapy is the fact that factor eight and factor nine can be made in cells other than those that normally make them. So we can put these these genes into other cell types and they can still make the factor. So that, that is one of the potential advantages. And then lastly, the end point of doing this, what, what the outcome or the ultimate uh, result of gene therapy is, is something we can measure pretty easily. We can measure factor levels and we can look at bleeding rates. And so 
All of these are features of hemophilia that make it an attractive target for gene therapy, and it's why it's been studied so extensively over more than 25 years. So what does gene therapy offer? What's the advance? Well, I mean, obviously, I think the advance is the potential for cure. But we need to take a second and think about what, what does cure really mean? Ideally, cure for hemophilia means zero spontaneous bleeds for the rest of your life. It means factor levels that are high enough that you'd never need additional treatment for surgery or for trauma, for example. And then this would, again, last a lifetime or at least a very, very long time. And of course, it would be safe. So I think that's the goal with gene therapy for hemophilia. We're, we're clearly not there yet, but that's where we're trying to get to, okay? All right, so another important thing to keep in mind with gene therapy for hemophilia is who are we currently studying and how does that translate into who we might be able to offer this treatment for outside of a study? So this slide shows you the basic inclusion and exclusion criteria for most of the currently ongoing hemophilia gene therapy studies. As you can see from, uh, from what's listed here, these are only being done in adults. These are generally only being done in those with severe hemophilia. These are being done in people who don't have a previous history of inhibitor, and that, that's a big important point. Um, we're doing this only in people who have healthy livers, uh, et cetera. So there are some limitations, and if we think about these clinical trial criteria and how that might translate into the real world eligibility, of course it's gonna depend on what the FDA says. So when a gene therapy for hemophilia is approved, there's gonna be some stipulations on the label that say who we can use it in. And certainly the payers are gonna have uh, some thoughts about who they'll pay for this in. And so if we look at what's currently being done in clinical trials, again, we're only using this in severe hemophilia patients who don't have an inhibitor or a history of inhibitor, who are adults, who have healthy livers and who don't have antibodies against that vector. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So if you use those same criteria and if that's what is approved for use outside of a clinical trial, at least right now as it stands, this is not gonna be something that's an option for everybody with hemophilia. And I think the big gaps here are certainly people under age 18 and those with a history of inhibitor. And so one of the unanswered questions is, will we be able to apply what we learn in these clinical trials of gene therapy for hemophilia into other populations that maybe weren't studied? And that's, that's a complex interaction of, of the science community and the clinical community and the regulatory community. So we're gonna have to figure all that out. So what do we know about gene therapy for hemophilia? Well, we know it works in humans, and I think that's really important. We've been doing this in mice for a lot of years. We've been doing it in other animal models for a fairly long time, but we now are doing it in humans, and we know that we can get it to work, at least to some degree. If you look across all the hemophilia gene therapy studies, most of the patients have gotten factor levels high enough to not need prophylaxis, at least for some length of time, and that's a huge milestone. We also know that gene therapy for hemophilia doesn't fix joints that are already damaged. Um, it's gonna hopefully prevent more joints from being damaged, but if you've already got damaged joints, those probably aren't gonna get any better. And although you know that we can live with that maybe, but I, th I think that's an important point to remember. We also know that there are a lot of people working very, very hard on gene therapy. If you look right now, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, that's the website where you can look up all the clinical trials that are going on right now. If you just do that, there are over 30 active and or enrolling hemophilia gene therapy studies right now. So a lot of clinical trials going on. Certainly not all of those are gonna pan out the way we want them to, but there's a lot of hard work going on getting this figured out. We still have a lot of work to do though. I mean, we've made tremendous progress getting this to where it is and we're very excited about gene therapy for hemophilia, but there are still some un unanswered questions. I think we're gonna have questions even beyond when the first gene therapies are approved for hemophilia uh, in our country. And so what are some of those challenges and questions? Well, the first set of challenges um, has to do with immune responses. So as I mentioned earlier, we're using viral vectors uh, to deliver the gene therapy for hemophilia. And so those viral vectors, those, those transport vehicles, some people have antibodies against those because these are viruses that you may have been exposed to out in the environment. Uh, these viruses um, are viruses that cause the common cold, they're inactivated when we use them in gene therapy, but, but your immune system may have already seen a virus that looks very similar to this vector, and you might have antibodies against it. Now, it de the likelihood of that happening depends on which of the different viral vectors are being used, uh, but up to about a third of people are gonna have antibodies against these vectors, and so that particular vector won't work for that person. And so we have to figure out ways around that. There are a variety of solutions that have been talked about and are being studied. Um, we don't have time to get into the details of that, but suffice it to say, we're working pretty hard to figure out a way around this potential uh, hurdle 
for gene therapy so it can be available for everyone. In addition, we see immune responses against the cells that have the gene delivered to them. Uh, and in most of the studies, this is going on in the liver. And so we see liver enzyme elevations. Uh, they're pretty common uh, in most of the studies, some more than others, depends a little bit on the details. Uh, these are generally managed with immune suppressants like prednisone, uh, although we still don't have a clear sense of what the optimal way to do that is. Uh, in some of the studies, some of the patients have had to use other drugs to, to deal with that immune response. And so there's a lot of work going on to try to clarify and optimize how we do that. Of course, we'd, we'd like to not use immune suppression if we could, because that comes along with some other potential uh, downsides for people who receive gene therapy. So I think a lot of work needs to happen to really optimize and clarify that. In addition, this is a bigger problem for some people than other versus others, even in the same study. And so there's some biology there that we still have to figure out as well. Uh, this is the last list of unanswered questions. Um, and these are pretty big questions. And, and I'm just going to throw them out there. Maybe in the discussion, we can talk about them if you want to, if you want to talk some more. But I think the first really big question is why doesn't gene therapy work as well in everyone? So if you look at the studies that are ongoing um, and you look at the patients in those studies, there's a pretty big spread of what the factor levels go to, uh, and we don't know why that is. We don't know why some people get levels into the normal range, uh, at least temporarily. Uh, other patients in these same studies getting the same treatment maybe don't get levels higher than 10 or 15% ever, uh, and we don't really understand why that is. We need to figure that out because if we're going to offer this treatment to someone uh, as we're sitting in clinic, I think one of the questions that should be asked is, how well is this going to work for me? Um, the answer to that is going to have a huge impact on the enthusiasm for proceeding with it. So we need to figure that part out. I already touched on the second bullet point, and that is, can we expand this outside of those who've been included in the clinical trials? And there's, again, sort of a complex interplay between the scientific community and the regulatory community to figure out the answer to that question. I think the third point here, um, you know, is really the maybe the million dollar question, and that is, how long is this going to last? We know from the data that's been presented already uh, with these gene therapy uh, for hemophilia treatments that the factor levels tend to decrease over time. Uh, we don't yet know how that's going to play out. Will they eventually go all the way back down to baseline? Will they level off and stay stable above a previous baseline? Um, how, how fast that happens, how long that's going to last, and, and how it might vary from person to person. These are all really important questions uh, that we're working on getting the answers to with these studies that are ongoing. Currently, we can't just redose you with the same vector uh, based on our current technology. So if, if you've got a gene therapy treatment right now and, and it wore off, um, we can't just give you a booster shot. Um, as, as you've heard in the news now with the COVID vaccines, we can't do that with this based on our current technology. So we'll need to figure that out as well uh, if this isn't a permanent fix. And then of course, long-term side effects, liver issues and other potential issues, we'll have to monitor for a long, long time to, to be fully confident for, that there aren't any long-term downsides. And all of this work is ongoing. And I'd be remiss, I guess, if I didn't you know, throw out the, the cost issue. How is this going to get paid for? How much is it going to cost? And, and what mechanisms are we going to need to come up with to, to pay for this? This is a really different type of therapy than any of the other treatments for, for hemophilia. And we're going to need to come up with some new models. And, and uh, there are people working really hard on that as well. I was part of a symposium earlier today where we talked a lot about uh, these sorts of issues. And so, so just a lot of questions. I, I don't mean to a wet blanket on gene therapy. Um, I, again, I think we're all very, very excited. We're very pleased with the progress that's been made. Uh, we eagerly anticipate the results of the trials that are ongoing. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that we haven't fixed this uh, 100%. We still have a lot of things to learn. I'm confident we will learn those things over time. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to take longer than we really want it to, but that's the way things work. All right, this brings me to the end. So we've got uh, about 10 minutes left here for questions and answers. So I, I wanna just kind of summarize what we talked about. And, and I know we covered a ton of material here. My goal was to really just highlight for you all the many advances in hemophilia therapy over the years, even before this stuff we've been talking about tonight. There's a lot of advances that have happened over a long period of time. And I think it's important for us to, for us to remember that, that history. The therapeutic landscape for hemophilia has changed quite a lot in the last five or six years, six or seven years, uh, with the development of the extended half-life products in 2014 and the non-factor therapy in 2017, things really changed quickly and are continuing to evolve at a very rapid pace. Uh, and as you can see from where we are with these clinical trials that I shared with you tonight, these, these things are going to continue to, to evolve rapidly over the next few years. So sort of strap in and, and hold on. There's a lot more data coming at us, a lot more things uh, happening. 
again, why is this all happening? And, and the, the real bottom line there is we, we're not satisfied. We, we aren't satisfied. The treatments we have are good enough. And I think that's a good place to be, that, that sort of desire for something better uh, for our patients and, and the community uh, is really what's driving all of this new drug development. And I think that's awesome. And then lastly, we just talked about gene therapy. Again, we've made a ton of progress, um, but we still have a lot to learn. And, and I think, uh, again, there's a lot of people working very hard on this. We will get the answers to these questions at some point. And when we do, uh, we'll have gene therapy available for, for many people uh, with hemophilia. So I think the future looks very bright. We just need to keep on the path that we've been on. All right, with that, I have come to the end of what I wanted to say to you guys. I thank you very much for your attention. I know it's late for some of you. I appreciate you, you tuning in and hanging in there with me. Uh, and I'll be very happy to take any questions you have uh, if, if you have any. So thanks very much for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Redding. That was fantastic, really appreciate it. Um, we definitely have questions uh, that have started to come in. And so you guys, please continue to put your questions in the Q&A and we'll, we'll ask as many as we can until it's time to, to close down. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Jay Patel. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, yes, doctor, we do have some questions um, from our attendees. So the first question is, as new products come out, dosing frequency is reduced. However, the reduction in factor used is not offset by the increase in factor cost. Therefore, most newer medications are not approved by our insurance plans. Due to the number of products on the market, when will we start to see more competitive pricing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, how much time do we have? <laughs> um, not enough. Um, so no, this, this, is a, this is a very important point. Um, and, and I think there's, there's, some, there's some truth to this. And I think there's maybe some misperception uh, to this. And I don't mean that uh, directly as the person that asked the question. But, you know, these, these newer products are expensive. Yes, that's true. Um, and I think we really saw this with the EHL drug in particular. So if you look unit per unit, the cost is higher. Um, and initially, the, the perception, I think, from the payer's perspective was, you know, we're just paying for convenience of having to dose less frequently. And, and I think there was a lot of pushback uh, that we received from the payers on that. What we've really focused on in the last few years, though, is to really sort of reframe that thinking uh, and, and recognize that if we use these products optimally, if we figure out who's the best fit for this product, and with the EHL drugs, that comes down to the pharmacokinetic guided dose tailoring so that we can really maximize the benefit, um, I think actually the cost is neutral and in some cases it's actually lower. So it might be more per unit, but the overall cost, if you've got better adherence, better bleed protection, ultimately the most clinically effective therapy is gonna be the most cost effective therapy too. And, and that's, I think that's a true statement. I believe it with every ounce of my being. Um, and I talk about this very passionately to the payers I think they're coming around. I think, I think the concept that the better we can prevent bleeds, ultimately that's gonna be the cheapest. And so um, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it requires a level of detail and a level of interaction uh, to get there. And I, I think we're working hard on that. NHF has been a huge part in supporting uh, those efforts. So uh, the point is well taken, these new things are expensive, um, but I think if we use them optimally and we, and we realize the benefits that they, that they offer, um, I, think, I think the cost uh, will work itself out okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question, um, with current lasting efficacy of Biomarin, do you, do you need to be off of Heme Libra to participate in gene therapy? Oh yeah, great question. Um, you know, that, I, I don't know specifically with individual trials uh, whether that will be allowed. I can tell you the general idea here is that people come into to gene therapy, we expect that they're gonna be on prophylaxis uh, by and large. Um, those that are on factor prophylaxis, I can, I can tell you from personal experience, um, the usual approach is to continue factor prophylaxis for the first four weeks and then stop. Um, I, I don't know specifically that emicizumab um, would be an exclusion, uh, but there'd made, there would need to be some sort of a adjustment for that. And the problem with that one, of course, is that when you stop taking it, it takes longer to wear off. Uh, and so um, I'm not sure that that's a, a question I can answer uh, for all the potential studies that are out there, but it's definitely an important one um, I think, I think that, you know, th this is part of the issue with, with, with gene therapy is that if you're already on a really effective treatment, um, you know, would you, would you want to, to do gene therapy the way it's currently 
uh, being done in a clinical trial setting and, and would you be eligible? I think th those are gonna have to be decided on an individual basis and uh, each individual trial will, will have its own requirements in that regard. So a good question and I wish I could give you a better answer to that one. All right, um, the next question, uh, with the new advancements for treatment for hemophilia, how do you think this will impact access for people throughout the world? Like, do you think it will help to reduce the health disparities between developed and developing countries? Yes, this is this is a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, yes, I mean, you know, we're really lucky in our country, right, that we've got access to to the treatments that we have. And, and I think it's important to be mindful of the fact that there are many, many people in other countries that don't have access. In fact, the, the majority of the folks with hemophilia in the world don't have access to to even basic hemophilia therapy. Um, yes, the, the, the answer to the question is yes. The hope is that some of these drugs would potentially uh, be easier to get into those developing countries that don't have the resources and the infrastructure, uh, certainly less frequent dosing, uh, the lack of need for refrigeration, um, even potentially gene therapy. I mean, if gene therapy works the way we'd like it to, you, you get treated, it works, and it lasts a really long time, um, doesn't require ongoing treatment, um, you know, that potentially could be done in resource limited uh, countries as well. And so I, I think all of us in the community are really looking down the road with that in mind, that we, we've got to figure out a way to get these treatments uh, to people who don't have access to the, what we would consider standard of care now. So, so thank you for bringing that up. I think it's a really important point. Um, all right, I think we still have a couple of more minutes. Um, uh, I am currently on an EHL factor product and I'm happy with it. Do you think companies will stop making factor and focus more on other types of treatments? Should I be worried? Uh, good, good question. Short answer is no. I don't think factor is going anywhere. Um, there are still some things that factor can do that other drugs that we have can't do. Um, I don't see factor ever going completely away short of us having a true cure for hemophilia. Uh, and I think we're a very, very long ways from that. So I think factor is always gonna have a role. Treatment of breakthrough bleeds, coverage for surgery, uh, trauma, that sort of thing. I mean, that's where factor really, um, really, really has a, a niche that the other drugs that we've been talking about don't. Um, there are people that may choose to stay on factor, um, and even though these other, other options may be available. If you're doing really well on factor and it's working for you, you know, that's great. Um, and so I, I think there's room for factor in this landscape that's evolving that we talked about tonight. I don't, I don't think it's going away. So I don't think you should be worried. I, and I'm happy to hear that you're doing so well. Got it. Um, I think we have one more. Um, okay. Is there data on the possible thrombotic potential of the, ooh, Marza, Marza Pat Cog? Wow. Uh, I know the one you're talking about. <laughs> okay, good. Thank God. Oh my God. Um, since it is much more potent than the current yeah. available level seven. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So, um, so I can't say that we have actual data or answer that very specifically, but you're bringing up an important point. And, and I did mention it in you know, some of the trials that we've seen with these newer drugs, we have seen some clotting issues. Uh, now they've largely been in trials where we're using drugs that work through new mechanisms of action. We, we've had bypassing agents, which is the category that Marzepicog is in. Um, but yes, all these drugs potentially have that uh, potential. And um, that's why we do the clinical trials. We need to do the studies to figure that out um, so that we, when we use these outside of a clinical study that we know that we can do it safely. So um, something that's being looked at very carefully. And I would argue that even in studies using factor, which we've been using for many, many years, one of the things we always monitor for uh, our thrombotic events. And so that's always, always on our mind uh, when we do these studies. Okay, thank you so much. I think with that, Brendan, you'll pick up. Absolutely. Well, thanks everyone for spending your evening with us or your morning or afternoon, depending.